Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a member at uh, Belmont Chapel, and it's my privilege today to continue our sermon series on the songs of the servant in the book of Isaiah. Me and the rest of the Yates family send our love to, to you, the rest of our church family. Whilst we're sad we, we can't be with you in person, it's great that we can stay connected this way during this time. If you're wondering why I'm wearing headphones, it's because uh, they have a mic on them, which makes the sound a bit better here at home. Today, a bit like a normal Sunday, we'll spend some time looking at a passage in the Bible together. This is continuing our series looking at writings by the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Writings that Christians believe foretell things about the life and death of Christ. The series is called Songs of the Servant, as that's who Isaiah is writing about, someone called the Lord's Servant, who Christians believe is Jesus. Jesus often quoted these verses and applied them to himself. This is the third out of four talks, each showing something different about Jesus. First, we had the gentle servant, Isaiah 42. Last week, we read about the trusting servant in Isaiah 49. Today, we'll consider the determined servant in chapter 50. And then next week, we'll conclude with the suffering servant and the famous prophecies from Isaiah 52 and 53 as we lead into Easter. So I invite you to uh, open your Bible, if you have one, um, to just, uh, just over halfway to Isaiah chapter 50. If you don't have a Bible, just search for Isaiah 50 on your phone. Today's passage is uh, verses 4 to 11, uh, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Isaiah writes, uh, this is what the Lord says. Verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I have offered my back, oh sorry, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who then is my, or who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Thank you. Please keep that open in front of you. Um, I'd like to start with, with a bit of a confession, if that's okay. Um, I like reading fiction for young adults. Uh, in particular, the author, uh, John Green, um, he wrote the, the Fault in Our Stars, which you may know. Um, I'll admit it. I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan. Um, his first book, Looking for Alaska, was recently made into a TV series on iPlayer. In Looking for Alaska, one of the characters is fascinated by the last words of Simon Bolivar, who was like the George Washington of South America. The, the, the book says that his last words were, how will I ever get out of this labyrinth? The characters wonder if... Uh, Bolivar's labyrinth could symbolize life or death. Is he trying to escape life or to escape death? They try to find out what the labyrinth is and how to escape it. Now, I doubt John Green is watching this, but I think I found an answer to Bolivar's question. 
How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? I'll come back to that later. First, I want to give some historical context for Isaiah's writing. The people of God in the Old Testament, uh, the nation of Israel, had been conquered by the Babylonians, who took them from their homes and into exile in Babylon. We see repeatedly in the Old Testament, God's people didn't listen to God. They snubbed his prophets. And when Isaiah writes this, they felt as a result, God had abandoned them. Uh, we didn't read verses 1 to 3 of uh, Isaiah 50, and, and they're a bit confusing. It says, uh, verse 1, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? In verse 2, do I lack the strength to rescue you by a mere rebuke? I dry up the sea. What's going on here is things have been going wrong for Israel. And we have these pictures of, of what uh, some of them believe. They think God's divorced them or that God sold them into slavery to, to pay off his debts. They had been unfaithful after all. They had committed adultery by worshipping other gods. Back then, a husband could um, divorce his wife fairly easily, but he had to, to give into her hand a certificate of divorce. And God says to Israel, you may have cheated on me, you may have been unfaithful, but I have not divorced you. Show me the certificate if you have one. I didn't have debts that meant I needed to sell you. I have not abandoned you. Isaiah writes to those who think they've been abandoned and also to those who think they're in exile because God's no longer powerful. They think Israel's God is, is no longer the strongest. But um, the Lord says, verse 2, uh, by a mere rebuke, I dry up the sea, recalling when he parted the sea to, to rescue them from slavery in Egypt. And we can sometimes think the same today. When everything is going wrong, when our world starts to fall apart, our faith can be shaken. And like the Israelites, we might think God's abandoned us, or God isn't powerful, or God isn't good, or God doesn't exist. And so given what's happening in the world, I want to briefly address the potential impact on our faith. Some people will be struggling with a lot right now, going through immense suffering, but their faith will be rock solid through it all. We Christians should come alongside them, keep in regular contact with them through the, the technology we have available, going through suffering together, helping others practically if we can, whilst observing public health guidelines. But for some, this whole situation maybe regardless of their personal circumstances, what they're seeing happen, glo happen globally might be really shaking their faith. So if that's you, I want to briefly address you today. Forgive me, I, I will get back to the passage, but I want to give a little personal testimony first. A few months ago, my faith took a hit. And I considered some tough objections to my Christian faith. I explored some compelling atheist arguments and doubt crept in. I was being asked to, to speak at church as normal. And I was thinking, I'm not sure I should, be, I should be doing this. But then I dug deeper. I found a podcast on YouTube from Premier Christian Radio called Unbelievable which quite bravely uh, puts often a great Christian thinker and a great atheist thinker in a room together to have a conversation about a, a specific argument for the existence of God, for example. One of our old uh, Belmont contact workers, Max, who's now a philosophy tutor at Oxford, was actually in one episode having a conversation with, with a brilliant atheist mind. And it turns out the presenter of the show, Justin Brearley, has written a book called Unbelievable, which says why after 10 years of talking to atheists, 
uh, or ten, 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. And he'd have conversations with Richard Dawkins and brilliant atheist thinkers for 10 years, hearing all their best arguments, yet he still finds Christianity to make the best rational sense of the universe uh, and explains why in his book. I've now thankfully come out of my period of doubt and my faith is much stronger for having gone through it. So today I wanted to speak to those for whom the, the current situation has knocked their faith. Don't let what's happening in the world right now destroy your faith. Let it refine it. If you're not a Christian watching this and you think COVID-19 and, and the suffering it, it's causing proves God doesn't exist, that's a good place to start. I challenge you, if you have more time at the moment, to, just as I did, dig deeper, dig a bit deeper into what you believe. You might find that beneath those feelings you have deep down that what's happening to humanity right now is objectively terrible, that human life is valuable and should be protected, that seeing the world suffering is heartbreaking, behind those feelings, you just might find there is a God who made you in his image, who loves you, who gives your life value and purpose, and who is, by his very nature, the definition of goodness. This period, for some of us, is a time to really examine our own beliefs. Sorry, that was a, a, a big tangent. Um, let's get back to our passage now in Isaiah 50. We'll, we'll very quickly break it into three parts and ask three questions. Firstly, in verses four to six, why should we listen to the servant? Verse four, uh, the servant has a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. The servant is well prepared. He listens closely and constantly to God the Father. So his words encourage tired and troubled people. And we see that from Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. Not only that, but the servant's words are backed up by action. Verses five and six. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I have offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah says the servant will be a rejected prophet. He will obey God, do what he is instructed and fulfill his mission, even if it means going through suffering. He does this without rebellion, without turning away. We see in the Old Testament, Israel rebelled again and again. We're all rebellious. We all turn away from God. But the servant is unique in that he keeps going. Even through suffering, the servant will obey whatever the cost. Critics um, often insist that the servant in in Isaiah is simply the nation of Israel. But I don't think that fits, given that they had always rebelled. And the writing is, is first person singular. I offered my back and my cheeks. I did not hide my face. Jesus is going to go through this torture and disgrace for us to show his willingness to save us. He gave his back to be flogged. He was mocked, spat at, and disgraced. Can you imagine being spat at and not hiding your face? The servant says, I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. He did that voluntarily for us. As Christians, we're called to emulate Christ, to take up our cross and follow him in the power of his spirit, to morning by morning, Awaken with open ears to our Father in heaven, praying and reading our Bible, for example. But the purpose of this passage in Isaiah it is not telling us to emulate the servant, 
but rather to gaze in wonder at the servant. We always fail. We always rebel. Our words don't match up to our actions. We are to turn to the servant and wonder at the one who did what we could never do. The servant's message deserves our utmost consideration as a result. Next question. What, uh, what makes the servant so determined? Looking at verses 7 to 9, which, which read like a, a court case drama. The servant says, I have set my face like flint. Similarly, in, in Luke 51, in the King James Version, it says Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross. The servant sets his face like flint. He moves forward in his mission with resolute determination. Here are two reasons for his determination. Firstly, he, he's confident in God's help. Verse 7, uh, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Verse 8, he who vindicates me is near. Verse 9, it is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Secondly, the servant knows he's innocent and will be vindicated. Like in Isaiah 53, the servant doesn't suffer because of his guilt. So he says, who then will bring charges against me? Who is my accuser? Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. There will be those that condemn him. But in time, they will, will fade away whilst the servant will in the end be victorious and ultimately uh, be shown to be innocent. With Jesus, his vindication was proven by his resurrection. In rising from the dead, he proved he wasn't a blasphemer. He was divine. And importantly for us, it showed that God the Father accepted Christ's death as a substitutionary sacrifice for the sin of mankind. So then, this language of vindication in the courtroom is applied to us who trust in Christ. We see that when, when the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians in Rome. Romans 8 verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 33 and 34. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. People may still condemn us in this life, but they'll fade in time. And ultimately, God gives us the verdict now and forever of not guilty. We've received a righteousness we didn't earn but that Christ, our champion, won for us on the cross. Last question before we finish. Why must we trust the servant? Let's remind ourselves of, of, of what it says in verses 10 and 11. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now... All you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Now, it's tempting to apply this darkness that Isaiah talks about to the tough time everyone's going through with COVID-19. And whilst it's true, if we're going through a tough time, we should trust in Jesus. That's not the point of this passage. The darkness Isaiah is referring to isn't suffering. I think it means spiritual darkness. The light is, is God and his truth. Darkness is, is not being able to see God, feeling distant from God. After all, Israel was physically distant from God at this time, from from Jerusalem and God's temple. The uh, theologian Matthew Henry writes, the Israelites walk in darkness when their evidences for heaven are clouded 
their joy in God is interrupted, the testimony of the Spirit is suspended, and the light of God's countenance is eclipsed. That darkness is something that we, we all experience. So the servant says to, to those in darkness who are away from God, listen to me, trust me. In Isaiah, God's not just, uh, sorry, excuse me. God's appealing not just to Israel in exile. God's appealing to the whole world that all nations would flock to the servant. And there are two responses to the servant. We can obey and trust the servant, even in darkness, or we can do what some of the Israelites were doing in Babylon. They lit their own fires. What Isaiah means is they turned to other gods. They would have actually lit fires to some of these Babylonian gods. These gods might have seemed more tangible, so rather, trust, rather than trusting in the Lord, Yahweh, they turned to another source of light. They kindled their own fires and worshipped false gods. And the same can be true for us. When we feel we're in spiritual darkness, we might find other things that give us light and warmth. It could be money, it could be health, it could be good deeds, could be some other philosophy. If we trust those things above God, we might not keep going through the darkness to find the ultimate light that lasts forever. We who trust in the name of the Lord, who hold onto his promises, though we may walk in darkness for a while with no light, shall ultimately be saved into everlasting light. Those who don't trust the servant, who, who light their own fires, Isaiah says, will lie down in torment, which, which is pretty bleak language. Uh, but it basically means you, sh you shall go to bed in the dark. Your false light will fizzle out. The atheist, uh, Christopher Hitchens, very sadly no longer with us, uh, was a brilliant writer and journalist, uh, an extraordinary man. He said, I wouldn't go to heaven if I was asked. Heaven would be hell for me. I don't want to live in some celestial North Korea where all I get to do is praise the dear leader from dawn till dusk. If in heaven we're with God, then we're in the light. Darkness is simply being completely cut off from God. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah warns us, if we light our own light, that torch will one day go out and we'll lie down in, in darkness, in total separation from God. This is why the famous prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9 is such good news. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 1, 4 to 5, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? I put it to John Green that the labyrinth could be this spiritual darkness, not being able to see the light to see God, we might be tempted to stop and light a fire, get warm and comfortable. But Isaiah says we need to keep going to persevere. You, you see, a labyrinth is different to a, a maze. It doesn't have different routes and, and dead ends. Rather, it's, it's one very long winding path. 
The Christian life, like a labyrinth, is not an easy road. It's full of twists and turns. But if we follow the path, if we keep trusting the servant, we will eventually arrive at God's doorstep and the brilliant blinding light of the Lord Jesus Christ. How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? Trust in the servant. Verse 10, let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus knows what it's like to feel abandoned by you. That he called out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lord, I pray for anyone at this time who, who feels abandoned. Please comfort them and reassure them that you will never leave them nor forsake them, no matter what happens in the coming months. Help us all to listen to Jesus, to trust him, and to follow him boldly. Help us to reflect his light. As Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Uh, finally, a couple of... Um, Discussion questions to uh, let you think about, chat through with others. Question one, in spiritual darkness, what are the fires you're tempted to light rather than relying on God? And, and question two, which of Jesus's words do you find sustain you when you're weary? Thanks for listening.